Please remain calm and follow the instructions given by our staff. Please turn off all cell phones and paging devices at this time. Flash photography and any form of video or audio recording during the performance are strictly prohibited. Thank you for coming to the World Theatre. Please sit back and enjoy the performance. Good evening, everyone. My name is Joe Cardinelli, and welcome to California State University Monterey Bay World Theatre. I'm the director of the World Theatre, and I have to just do a little business before we start. We have about three minutes to go. I uh, need to tell you that we are on live. We're on uh, public radio tonight on KAZU 90.3. So, hey, there we go. Hey, radio. Okay. <laughs> So we're live tonight, and we have to start at a certain time, which I think is 7.06 exactly. I'll bring Phil out with the headsets, and then he'll count you down. And when we count you down, we want you to all applause and give all those kind of cheers. So we'll let everybody know in the Central Coast that we're here at, UC, at uh, California State University of Monterey Bay. I don't know if you uh, missed some of the announcements, but this is a time to turn off your cell phones. Uh, pagers, iPhones, iPods, Blackberries, you know, I guarantee you that the world will still be out there, you know, when, when you turn these back on. Um, there's no flash photography, no recording devices. In case of emergency, there are exits on left and right of the auditorium, and the lights will come up, and ushers will help you get out of the facility and the building. So um, just need to tell you those kind of things. I don't know where we are time-wise, Greg. I don't see any lights up there, so that gives me a little bit more time here. This is the first of our series, uh, first speaker of our series, and um, coming up in the f in spring, we have uh, Juno Diaz, who is a Pulitzer Prize winner. Yes, absolutely, he's going to be great uh, from MIT. So you should uh, look look in the papers, and that'll be coming up. And then you know, get your tickets early because you know that we're basically sort of sold out tonight, and we have about a hundred and. 25 people next door in the overflow room, and we also are on the university network now. So uh, Phil is going to come out because they're giving me the single, which means I need to get off the stage. And then Phil is going to count us down, and we'll want those applause. So our radio annou announcer's announcement will go out on N National Public Radio. Okay, here's Phil. <laughs> you want this, Phil? Okay. How you doing, CSU Monterey Bay? Ah, oh, come on. You can do better than that. How you doing tonight? And you all got in. Remember, we're changing a new leaf here. You got to get your reservations in early so you can get a seat. All right? Not only for the speaker series, but also for the wonderful World Seri uh, Theater speaker seri uh, series. Presenting series. What can I say? Okay. Uh, I got to check and see what we're doing. We're just waiting for Casey to come online. How are we doing, guys? This is how it's done. A minute 30? Oh my god, okay. Ow. All right. Ah, a minute 30, oh my god. Sorry, boss, it's Kezu's problem. <laughs> Gee, this is so difficult, you know. I've never been on stage before, boss. <laughs> oh, Joe did forget to mention not only do we have the two exits on the left and right, but there's exits in the back. They also. Uh, the one additional point is, uh, before you hit them, please wait for myself and a couple of the other elder staff to get out first, and then you guys can ah, just follow us out and hit it together. Uh, also, another thing, uh, in the overflow, we have a special arrangement with the Otter Bay restaurant for a lot of these functions, and you can have dinner there beforehand, get reservations, they give you a great deal, and then you can just come on over and then just have a good time. We're increasing our Phil's Cafe out in front. Yes, I named it myself. Uh, beer, wine, and so forth. <laughs> okay, all right. Now we're down to 30 seconds, so we're going to warm it up. I'm going to get off the microphone, and we'll get start to uh, rev it up and let the Central Coast know that we're alive and well in Monterey Bay, and we have a wonderful speaker for tonight. So, the book will be available in the lobby. We got lots of books, okay? So you get them all signed and so forth. All right. Ready, go. Six. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to the CSUMB President Speaker Series. I'm Renee Curry, and I'm the coordinator of the President's Speaker Series program. 
Just to remind you, for those of you who haven't been here before, the way we choose our speakers is through our faculty. Our faculty tell us and decide who the speakers are in any given year that we really need to hear from. And then we invite these folks to come and be part of our intellectual community to inspire us. This year, as was already mentioned, um, we are experiencing some budget cuts. I will not dwell on that. However, we have two speakers. I know other years you've had many, many more speakers. But this year, because we are because we want to make sure that we continue to provide speakers for our community, we've brought to you Dr. Brian Green, who will be here this evening to talk with you about string theory. And in February, Pulitzer Prize winner Juno Diaz will be here to speak with us also. I want to invite you to welcome our president, Diane Harrison, who will give you an introduction to Dr. Brian Green. Please welcome <laughs> President Harrison. Good evening, and I too want to thank you so much for joining us for this first speaker and our 09010 President Speaker Series. Dr. Brian Green received his undergraduate degree from Harvard University and his doctorate from Oxford University where he was a Rhodes Scholar. He joined the physics faculty of Cornell University in 1990 and was appointed to the position of full professor in 95 and in 1996 joined Columbia University as a professor of physics and mathematics. He has lectured at both a general and technical level in more than 25 countries and is widely regarded for a number of groundbreaking discoveries in superstring theory. For those of you who are unfamiliar with superstring theory, you are in for a real treat. Since he is not only the lead researcher in this theoretical realm, he is, always, he is also someone who can clearly explain these concepts to people who do not have a science background and leave you hungry for more. Professor Green is the best-selling author of The Fabric of the Cosmos, Space, Time, and the Texture of Reality, The Elegant Universe, and a children's book, I Care Us at the Edge of Time. The Elegant Universe has sold more than a million copies, became an Emmy and Peabody award-winning Nova special that Dr. Green hosted. The Fabric of the Cosmos spent six months on the New York Times bestseller list and, and inspired the Washington Post to describe Green as the single best explainer of abstruse ideas in the world today. Indeed, when reading Dr. Green's books, we are struck with a sense of awe that he can take such abstract and mathematical concepts as the basic structure of space and time itself and make it real to us through his writing style and his extensive use of metaphor. Like a well-written novel, we are kept raptured by the tale he tells us that not only documents our current of the understanding of the world from the perspective of a theoretical physicist, but he does so in a fashion that can capture the hearts and the imaginations of those who venture into the pages of his books. His writing is truly a great gift and one that has been incredibly popular and well-received both nationally and internationally. Professor Green has many national media appearances, including Nightline, The Charlie Rose Show, The Late Night Show with David Letterman, Late Night with Conan O'Brien, and The Colbert Report. One of my favorites. He's also made cameo appearances in the films Frequency, Maze, and the last Mimsy. 
He recently co-founded the World Science Festival, which debuted in New York City in the spring of 2008 as an annual celebration of science that brings together great minds in science, business, government, and the arts. And I'm sure you, that you are as eager as I am to hear what Dr. Green has to tell us about the very fabric of the cosmos in which we live. Please help me welcome Dr. Brian Green. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be here, and thank you for that warm introduction. I didn't know that President Harrison was going to mention that I played cameo roles here and there in some films, but um, I don't know, seeing that I'm in California, and I, maybe I'll reprise one of them for you right here, right now, if that's okay. So just give me a second. I, I, I wasn't planning to do this. I've got to get into character, it seems like. Hey, good question. <laughs> so I want to begin with a, with a quick apology. I'm a little bit under the weather <clears throat> and uh, had to cancel a number of meetings that were planned with students, which um, I'm unhappy about. But um, <clears throat> I hope that some of them are here and perhaps some of their questions will be asked uh, in the end in the question session. But it does give me the opportunity, before I get into tonight's subject matter, to share with you some other research uh, that has not yet been published. Um, I have actually been getting sick with a kind of flu almost every, every six, eight weeks for about the last two, three years. Mysterious. The doctors couldn't figure out what it was, you know. So formed a little clandestine research group. Scientists try to figure out what it is that was was making me sick. And um, and indeed, finally, we 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 narrowed in and came to the answer of um, and what it is. And I'd like to just share it with you. If you can turn the projector on, it's a two two particular culprits. Um, <laughs> uh, the one on the right uh, is Alec. He's my my little uh, four-year-old, and. Uh, one on the left is uh, Sophia, uh, the, the older child, uh, is my niece. She was not implicated uh, in the study at all. Uh, but these two bring home just about every communicable disease known to humankind. Um, <clears throat> so the, uh, the subject tonight, though, is, is, is not these guys here. It's the fabric of space and time. The fabric of space and time. So let me just get these guys off for a second. <laughs> that is so sweet of you, thank you. But uh, there are other, other matters at hand. <clears throat> okay, so what we're going to talk about is space and time. Now, space and time are the most familiar of ideas that science has put in front of us. I mean, everything we do, everything we think, takes place in some region of space during some interval of time. Space and time, in essence, really form the very arena of reality. And if we learn, as we have, and as I'll discuss here tonight, that space and time are not what we think they are, then what we're really learning is reality, is not what we think it is. And what I'd like to do is take you through a series of ideas that have, over the last few centuries, changed our conception of space and time dramatically, revolution after revolution after revolution. And ultimately, I will come to the insights of our age, which have largely come from this subject that was mentioned by President Harrison, superstring theory. Now, I should say, superstring theory is a controversial subject. It is a subject, I mean, for instance, when I wrote The Elegant Universe, it, like all books, came out on Amazon. As I trust you know, Amazon allows, you know, anyone who's read a book, or even hasn't read a book, to, to write in a review, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, a few short days after my book came out, the uh, review was written by someone who gave it five stars, so at first it looked like an, an, a nice positive review, but then when you read down in the details, <clears throat> the person said that they were so happy that someone had written a book 
on string theory that was accessible because they said it's very hard to criticize things that you don't understand. And then they went on to say that after reading my book, they felt string theorists were a bunch of buffoons running around chasing their own tails and concluded the review by saying that they felt that the author, namely me, seemed to be about as happy as a pig in shit. I was wondering, how do you, how do you sign pig and shit? Uh, that's good, that's good to know. Thank you. Appreciate that. Now, now what, what, this, what this person meant by that comment was that string theory is not a proven scientific subject. It is an interesting, powerful collection of ideas, but it has not yet received experimental support. So I will be very careful in the discussion tonight to draw a sharp distinction between the scientific ideas that I'll talk about that are established, that have made contact with experiment versus those which are more speculative. But I hope to convince you that the more speculative ones are sufficiently interesting, sufficiently compelling, that they're worthy of the attention that we are focusing upon them. And I'll finish up at the end of the discussion here tonight with one possible way in the next few years that these ideas might be tested. It's a long shot, but they might be tested. Okay, so that's the plan. So let's launch in. <clears throat> there are many places in the history of science that you can pick up the chain of ideas that I'm going to talk about here tonight, but I think it's really worth starting more or less at the beginning with Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton in late 1600s was consumed with understanding the laws of motion, how things move. Now that may seem like a limited scientific endeavor, but if you think about it, everything in the universe, from the motion of planets and stars to the thoughts that are now going through your head to your eardrums that are vibrating back and forth, all of it is described in terms of motion. So in principle, if you understand the fundamental laws of motion, there's a chance, perhaps, that you understand just about everything in the universe. Powerfully, Newton wrote down three laws of motion, and they are laws of motion that we still teach to our high school students today. Part of the story, however, that we don't emphasize to our students is that when Newton wrote down these three laws of motion, he needed to anchor them in something. He found that without having a solid substrate within which these laws could be entrenched, they were meaningless. And he found that what he needed to anchor them with was a definition of space and a definition of time. So because of that, Newton stood up to the plate. Maybe that's not the right uh, metaphor. Uh, baseball wasn't around. Um, uh, Newton rose to the challenge and gave a definition to space and a definition to time. He declared, space is. It is an eternal, unchanging stage on which the events of the universe take place. Absolute unchanging, it is out there for eternity. Time as well, he said, time just is. He said, it's as if there is a grand cosmic clock out there in the universe, ticking second after second after second, relentlessly pulling us all into the future in a manner that is the same regardless of where you are or what you are doing. Absolute eternal space, absolute eternal time. Now, there were people, even in Newton's age, who when he declared this absolute space, absolute time, said that, no, it wouldn't be right. How could that be right? In fact, the, the most vociferous critic was a philosopher, Gottfried Leibniz. And when he heard about Newton's ideas of absolute space and absolute time, he said, mm-mm-mm, mm-mm. Mm -mm. So naturally, Newton said, what do you mean by mm -mm, mm mm And Leibniz said, well, I don't think you can declare something to be real if it's absolute, if it's beyond our ability to affect, beyond our ability to change. He said, I don't think there is such a thing as absolute space and time. He said, I think 
space and time are merely the vocabulary that allows us to say where something is relative to something else, when something takes place relative to some other event. But without the objects in space or the events in time, Leibniz said, space and time have no independent meaning. <coughs> it's a very subtle idea. But just to give you a feel for <clears throat> what it means, think instead of something a little bit more down to earth. Think about the alphabet, the English alphabet, 26 letters. There are a lot of interesting relationships between the letters. A is next to B, B is next to C, and so forth. But if I reach into the alphabet <clears throat> and pull out the letters one by one, Z, throw it away, A, throw it away, W, X, U, V, throw them away. When I throw the last letter away, what's left? Is it an empty alphabet? No, it, it's nothing. The alphabet only has meaning by virtue of the letters that constitute it. Without the letters, there is no alphabet. Similarly, Leibniz says, without the objects in space, there is no space. If you were to reach into space and pull out the Earth, the Moon, the Sun, the Milky Way galaxies, when you throw out the last piece of material substance in space, Leibniz says, you are not left with empty space. You're left with nothing. Now, who was right? Who was wrong? It was difficult to say. But here's the thing. Newton, with his laws of motion, could make predictions of how things move. And the predictions were borne out by observation. Let me just, to get us all on the same page, giving you a simple example. So if you can just bring the lights down for a moment. So the prototypical example of Newton's ideas is a planet like the Earth in motion around the sun, and using the mathematical laws that he wrote down, you could plot where the Earth or the other planet should be at any given moment. And the thing is, when you then look up into the sky, the planets are just where the math says. You can bring the lights back up, says that they should be. That's a very powerful piece of evidence that Newton got it right. So for about 200 250 years, this notion of an absolute unchanging space and time hardly had any further critics. That is until something dramatic happened. Early part of the 20th century, a new thinker comes on the stage of physics, a thinker for whom there is no such thing as received wisdom, no such thing as a question that had been answered in the past and couldn't be re-examined, someone for whom every issue was put back on the table. And of course I'm referring to Albert Einstein. And when Einstein began to think about Newton's ideas, especially his ideas of space and time, he came to the conclusion that they were not right. And the way that he came to this conclusion was by careful examination of one of the very laws that Newton wrote down, the law of gravity. It's the law, in fact, that was underlying the little visual I showed you a moment ago. It's a simple law. It says that every object in the universe attracts every other with a force, we call it gravity, that depends on two things. How big they are, how massive they are, and how far apart they are in space. F equals G M1 M2 over R squared, if you like equations. But that's the basic idea. Now, Einstein looked at that equation and asked the kind of question that a five-year-old would ask. And that's really, in a sense, where Einstein's genius lay. He was willing to ask the childlike questions and take them very seriously, think them through to their logical conclusion, sometimes resulting in a revolution in how we think about things. Now, in this particular case, the seemingly simple question was, how does gravity work? How is it, as in that little visual, that the sun, which is 93 million miles away from the Earth, and there's basically empty space in between them, how does the sun affect the Earth's motion? I mean, there's no rope between them. There's no arm that reaches out and clutches hold of the Earth. What is the means, the mechanism, by which gravity gets the job done. Now, to try to <clears throat> figure out the answer to this question, 
Einstein naturally wanted to know what was Newton thinking about? He must have thought about this question, he figured. So he went to the Principia, Newton's Principia, which has all the results in math and physics that Newton discovered in his lifetime. And I have to say, I was very pleased when I was told earlier today that the Principia was the required reading for tonight's lecture. In fact, I, I, <clears throat> I was sort of blown away when I was told that you all were required to read it in the original Latin. Uh, I haven't even done that. So anyway, you all know this, this part of the story, but maybe for the um, one or two listeners at home that maybe didn't finish the reading, let me uh, just continue on with this part of the story. So <clears throat> Einstein went over to the Principia, opened it up to letter G, found the universal law of gravity, went a little further to the subheading M, the mechanism by which gravity operates. And there he found something surprising because Newton basically says, I don't know how gravity works. He said, I've been able to figure, figure out a mathematical law that seems to accurately describe its strength, its properties, but I've not been able to figure out how it actually transmits its influence. In fact, in his own words, he said, to the answer of that important question, the mechanism by which gravity operates, he said, I leave it to the consideration of the reader. <clears throat> now, you know, naturally, most readers would read that and read on. And here, here's where Einstein was different. When he read that, he saw a deep, profound challenge that he wanted to try to resolve. He wanted to figure out how gravity works. And the reason why this is relevant to the story we're following here tonight is because after 10 long years of intense mathematical study, the answer he came to is that the mechanism for transmitting gravity from here to here is nothing but the fabric of space. In fact, the fabric of space and time. He, unlike Newton, said space is not this unchanging backdrop. He said space does something. It communicates gravity. Now, how does it do that? Well, it does it, according to Einstein, because it can warp and curve. A fantastically subtle idea, which, again, is, I think, best approached through an analogy first, and then I'll show you a visual. The analogy is, is one that we physicists absolutely love to use in this, in this setting, and it goes like this. Forget about the universe for a moment. Instead, imagine that I have in front of me a rubber sheet that's stretched nice and taut. And imagine in your mind's eye that I take a marble and I set it rolling along the surface of the rubber sheet. You can see in your mind that the marble will just roll in a straight line, nothing, nothing too complicated. But now if I change things a little bit and I take a rock and I sit it in the middle of the rubber sheet, now the sheet is curved, it's warped, it's deformed. If I take that same marble and I set it rolling along the surface, it doesn't go in a straight trajectory any longer. Now you can see in your mind, it'll go into a curved trajectory because it's rolling along the curved surface of the rubber sheet. Einstein says, take that simple idea and apply it to the universe in the following way. Instead of a rubber sheet, he says, think of the fabric of space, the stuff that's all around us. And he says, rather than thinking of a rock warping a rubber sheet. Imagine that, say, the sun, merely by virtue of its presence in space, is able to warp the space all around it. Then the Earth, like the marble, goes into orbit because it's rolling through this curved environment. That, he said, is how gravity works. Let me show you a visual on that. If you could bring the lights down again, please. So, <clears throat> We'll begin looking at space. This is 3D space, a grid-like icon that I'll often use. It's a little hard to picture 3D space, so let me go to a two-dimensional analog that captures all the ideas. And as you see here, it's space is nice and flat if there's nothing there, but when the sun appears, the fabric warps. Similarly, in the vicinity of the Earth, the Earth warps space around it. And now I want you to focus your attention on the moon because this is the main point. The moon is kept in orbit because it's rolling along a valley in the curved environment that the Earth creates. That is how gravity is transmitted. Now, if we pull back, look at the motion of the Earth, it too is kept in orbit because it is rolling along a valley in the distorted environment created by 
the sun. That's what he found. This was a spectacular moment, not only in the search for the deep laws of physics, but in the story of space and time. Because now we learn that unlike what Newton thought, space and time are not just sitting out there as observers, bystanders. Space and time are intimate players in the dramatic unfolding of the cosmos. And it's not just out there in space. I mean, right now, I am warping the space around me, not by much, because I don't weigh that much, similarly for all of you. The Earth is warping space around it. I mean, right now, for instance, I feel the stage on my feet. I feel like I'm being pulled down, right? You feel it somewhere else. And the reason, according to these ideas, is that the Earth is warping space, and our bodies want to slide down an indentation in space, but the stage and the seats get in the way. And that's why we feel that force. Space and time come alive with Einstein's discovery. Now this, while a great moment to be sure, also had another unintended consequence. Because sometimes by having a dramatic breakthrough in science, you open up a whole nother can of worms, a whole nother set of questions that you didn't even have the vocabulary to ask before the discovery was made. And what happened is, when Einstein established that space and time are real, they can be affected, they're as real as this podium, that meant that they are subject to the very same laws of physics that any other real entity is subject to. And it turns out that a particular set of laws discovered in the 1920s and 1930s called quantum mechanics, when those laws are applied to space and time, a major, major conflict arises. And I'd like to tell you about that conflict because it will lead to superstring theory and some of the dramatic revolutions that we are living through today. So to do that, I need to say a few words about quantum mechanics, which is itself a rich, robust, strange, mysterious subject, easily a subject that could fill a lecture, many lectures in its own right. And in fact, I, I was asked to wrap it up tonight within four or five hours, so <laughs> I have to be a, a little bit lean in, in my choice of what I tell you about in quantum mechanics. But um, briefly put, quantum mechanics was developed in the 1920s and 1930s because scientists found that when they applied the older ideas of physics from the 1800s and the early 90s, even the ideas of Einstein, when they tried to apply those ideas to the newly emerging microscopic realm that they finally had access to, the molecules, the atoms, the subatomic particles, the small things, they found that the existing laws, when applied in the realm of the small, gave wrong predictions. For instance, the existing laws said that every single atom should self-destruct in a fraction of a second. It doesn't happen. I mean, thankfully it doesn't happen. But that alerted scientists to the need to have a body of physical law that would give an accurate description of the small things. And quantum mechanics is that body of law. Now, of the things, strange things about quantum mechanics that you may have heard of, or perhaps some of you may know quite a lot about, there are things like particle wave duality. There are possibilities of parallel universes. There's there's the idea of quantum tunneling. You know, that's the idea that were I to walk across the theater and walk right into the solid wall on the other side. Quantum mechanics says that on most attempts, I'll just hit the wall and bounce right off, but it says there's a small probability that on one of those attempts, I'll actually pass right through the wall and emerge on the other side unscathed. It's a small probability. But it is not a zero probability, and that is the key fact. Because the microscopic version of that experiment, <clears throat> not a person, but a little particle like an electron, if you fire it into a barrier, that the older ideas said the electron cannot penetrate that barrier, simply can't be done, 
quantum theory says, well, actually, there's a small probability that it can penetrate. And when you do the experiment over and over again, every so often, the electron does penetrate. So these ideas, however strange they may be, need to be taken seriously because they are supported by experimental data. Now, the only feature of quantum mechanics that will be relevant to the story of, of space, story of space and time that we're talking about here tonight is a feature of quantum mechanics called the uncertainty principle, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. I, I mean, just to get a sense, how many people are, are, have heard of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle? Ah, quite a few. I mean, of those, of those who have raised your hands, I mean, how many of you think you pretty much, pretty much got it? You, you know what Heisenberg was? <laughs> oh, still. Still, still a few. Any of those, keep your hands up. Any of those have your hands up now? You want to come up here and just give a little <laughs> description? Now, it's hard. It's hard to, to describe the uncertainty principle because it's, it's so, so very unfamiliar. Excuse me for one second. <clears throat> and there are many ways to try to think about the uncertainty principle. And, and one way might be this. You know, I... Having just pulled into town earlier today, I'm not really familiar with the kinds of Chinese restaurants you have here in Monterey. Um, but some of you may know that in Manhattan's Chinatown, if you go into certain restaurants, they hand you what they call a special order menu. We've got dishes in column A, other dishes in column B, and they say, if you order the first dish in column A, you can't order the corresponding first dish in column B. And if you order the second dish, you can't order the second dish and the second one. And, and that's, that's basically the uncertainty principle. <laughs> Let me just be a little bit more precise than that. After all, we're on radio and television here. The uncertainty principle tells us that knowledge of the microscopic realm is, in fact, very much like that list divided into two columns. And it tells us that knowledge of one feature from the microscopic realm fundamentally compromises your ability to know a corresponding feature of the micro world from the second list. And in fact, it says, the more you know about this feature, the less you know about its partner. The more you know about its partner, the less you know about the first feature. Now, let me just give you a concrete example. I mentioned electrons a moment ago, little particles of make it matter. If you apply the uncertainty principle to an electron, here's what it says. It says you cannot know where an electron is and how fast it's moving at the same time. And in fact, the better you know where it is, the less you know about its speed. The more you know about its speed, the less you know about its position. And I need to emphasize, <clears throat> this has nothing to do with how good an experimenter you are, nothing to do with how good your equipment is. This is a fundamental limit that comes from the laws of quantum mechanics. Now, again, I, I emphasize that this is so unfamiliar because, I mean, when you look around the world, I mean, look at this podium, it seems that we can say where it is and how fast it's moving, right? I mean, where is it? Right there. How fast is it moving? You know, it doesn't seem to be moving at all. Seemingly in violation of the uncertainty principle, I've now specified both of those pieces of data. Now, this really is not a violation of the uncertainty principle, of course, because Heisenberg didn't just walk down the street in 1927 and declare uncertainty. He worked out a mathematical law. And that mathematical law tells us the minimal amount of uncertainty in any situation, and it tells us that minimal amount of uncertainty with total certainty. <clears throat> And when you apply that mathematical law to a big object, it says the amount of uncertainty is fantastically small. There is some uncertainty in the position and motion of this podium. It's just so tiny that we don't notice it. But that very same mathematical law tells us that if you look at smaller and smaller and smaller things, the amount of uncertainty gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So down in the microscopic realm, uncertainty reigns supreme. Now, I like to summarize this fundamental uncertainty in the quantum domain <clears throat> as basically telling us that in the realm of the small, things are, are fundamentally jittery or turbulent or chaotic, frenetic, because there are features of the microscopic realm that we can't nail down precisely, which means in some sense they're 
able to fluctuate among all manner of possibility consistent with our limited knowledge of what actually is going on. And it's that jittery, chaotic character of the micro world that makes quantum mechanics so at odds with Einstein's views of space and time, his views in his theory of gravity, his general theory of relativity as it's called. How does that come about? Well, I showed you a visual a moment ago. The sun appeared, the fabric curved, but it was a nice, gentle shape, nice, gentle curvature. Quantum theory says that if you were to look at a tiny, tiny, tiny piece of space, the curvature would not be tiny at all. Space would look like a violently fluctuating, violently boiling surface, completely at odds with the key imagery underlying the mathematics of Einstein's theory. And that's why quantum theory and Einstein's ideas of space and time and general relativity are antagonists. Let me show you what that would look like visually. So if you can bring the lights down. So if we begin where Einstein's ideas work in the realm of the big, space is nice and gentle. But now if we take a journey in an elevator, an imaginary elevator that lets us go factors of 10 smaller every step of the way. Now according to quantum uncertainty, the amount of uncertainty is getting larger and larger the smaller we get. Now we pass through the scale of atoms. The jitteriness from quantum uncertainty comes into view. You see some of that jitteriness right here. But let's go much, much smaller, 100 billion, billion times smaller, in fact. And if we do, here's what quantum uncertainty says the fabric of space itself would look like. A violently undulating fabric, pieces ripping off, coming back together. It's like a boiling stew of space itself. And this image is so at odds with Einstein's image that the two theories just are incompatible. Now, if we go back up to larger scales, going factors of 10 larger and larger every step of the way, the amount of uncertainty gets smaller. At the scales of atoms, as you see here, there still is some uncertainty. But if we keep on going larger and larger through the scales of everyday life, up to the scales of stars and galaxies, the amount of uncertainty gets so small that we completely miss it. We don't see it at all. And we do recover the nice, gentle imagery, the nice, gentle curvature of space in which Einstein founded his ideas. That's why Einstein works fantastically well here, but he fails completely if his ideas are pushed into the realm of the small. Once space and time are real, they're subject to quantum uncertainty, wild fluctuations take over, everything falls apart. Now, I did mention how small you have to go to encounter this problem. Anyone catch the number that I threw out? 100 billion billion times smaller than an atom. That's 10 to the minus 35 meters. Decimal point, 34 zeros and a one. And there is absolutely no denying it. That is pretty small. So small that I could imagine you wondering in the privacy of your own brain, who cares? <laughs> you know, if we have an understanding of gravity, space, and time, when you're talking about scales of stars and galaxies and the entire universe, and if we have another description of atoms, molecules, subatomic particles that work so long as you don't push into that fantastically small realm, maybe that is enough to simply call it a success, pack it up, and go home. And you know, framed that way, it's pretty convincing. So I'll end the discussion here. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, um, there are thousands of scientists, including me, around the world who have dedicated their lives to trying to solve this problem. And I think there are two ways of thinking about where the motivation comes from. Not everybody agrees with the first motivation, but I think that what we are trying to do as scientists is not merely model how the world works. I think we're after the truth of how the world works. And if the laws that you have, however good they may be, if they break down in any circumstance, however extreme, if they break down at all, that to me is the clear signal that we've not reached the deepest truth. The second motivation is a little bit more concrete. <clears throat> a question that people have asked 
for perhaps as long as we could ask questions is how did the universe begin? Where did it come from? And that's a question that you will never be able to address scientifically until you resolve this problem. The reason is quite clear. If you were to take a film of the universe, we know that the universe is expanding over time, which means that if you wind the film back toward the beginning, the universe gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Now here's the thing. All of the universe is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, so it's very heavy, which means you need Einstein's theory of gravity. But because the spatial extent of the universe is getting smaller and smaller, at some point it's so small that you need quantum mechanics. And if the two theories don't work together, then you're unable to press any further back than about you know, a tiny fraction of a second after the beginning. So if you really want to figure out how it got started, this is certainly a problem that you need to resolve. You've got to square up the laws of the big and the laws of the small. And thankfully, in our age, we think we may have done that in this approach called superstring theory. And for the story I'm telling here tonight, it's especially exciting because string theory has given rise to its own revolutions in how we think about the fabric of the cosmos. So what I'd like to do in the remaining time is tell you a bit about string theory and then focus in on a couple of the strange ideas about the fabric of the cosmos that it proclaims to be true if indeed the theory is correct. Now, here is where I need to draw the sharp distinction that I alluded to early on between science that has been established and science that is wholly speculative. In fact, the word string theory is, is a misnomer. Theory in science is a very specific kind of structure. It generally means a collection of ideas that can explain observations in an economical and powerful predictive manner. String theory doesn't yet do that and therefore it should really be called the string hypothesis. But you know, historical happenstance, people got used to calling it string theory and, and there you go. But you really need to draw a distinction between what we know and what we are currently working on, excited about, but don't yet know whether it's right or wrong. Okay, so with that disclaimer, into string theory. So what is string theory? Well, at first sight, it is a theory that doesn't seem to have much to do with the questions that we've been talking about, the fabric of the cosmos type questions. Instead, string theory aims to address a different question, a question that the Greeks asked two and a half thousand years ago, which is what are things made of? What are the fundamental ingredients in all of the matter we see in the world around us? I mean, take this, this piece of wood, cut it in half, cut a remaining piece in half, keep on slicing it to ever smaller pieces. The question is, what is the finest uncuttable constituent, elementary, indivisible piece of this piece of matter that you get to if you cut sufficiently finely? Now, the Greeks christened atoms as those uncuttable ingredients. In fact, atom means uncuttable. In our age, we have another version of atom, a more scientific one, but certainly it is cuttable. It is not the end of the story. Atoms have a nucleus with neutrons and protons, and you've got electrons orbiting around, and inside the neutrons and protons there are even smaller constituents, the quarks. Now that is where the conventional theoretical and experimental ideas stand. Electrons, quarks, a few other exotic species of particles are envisioned to be little tiny dots with no further substructure. The basic idea of string theory is simply to challenge that and to suggest that there may be a further level of structure. Inside of these particles, string theory specifically suggests, you would find something else if you magnified it sufficiently large. And the new entity that you'd find inside these particles is a little tiny filament. It's a little string-like filament. That's why it's called string theory. It's a little string-like filament of energy, which, like a string on a violin, can vibrate in different patterns. Now, when a violin string vibrates in different patterns, we hear it as different musical notes. When these little tiny strings vibrate in different patterns, it's not different music, it's different kinds of particles. A string vibrating in one pattern might be a quark. A string vibrating in a different pattern might be an electron. That, in a nutshell, is what the theory says. 
So let me just give you a quick visual to emphasize that point. Bring the lights down. Thank you. So rather than going into a journey into the fabric of space as we've done before, let's just take a journey into a familiar piece of matter taken to be a candle in a holder. So if we zoom into this object and we go smaller and smaller, at some point you get to the atoms we were talking about where you have the electrons in orbit around the nucleus with the neutrons and protons. And inside the neutrons and protons are the quarks. This is where the conventional ideas stop. The new idea of string theory is now coming into view. You can see there's a little filament inside each of these particles, vibrating in different patterns. And if these ideas are correct, the wonderful richness of everything we see in the universe around us at a microscopic level owes its origin to the different vibrations of these strings, the different musical notes, if you will, that these little tiny strings can play, vibrating matter and energy, perhaps space and time themselves, into existence. That is the core of the theory. Now, presented that way, I can well imagine a natural question being, well, if that's what the theory says, why don't you just test it? I mean, just look inside the particles and see if the string is there. And that is an absolute fine suggestion. The, the problem is one of scale. So these strings, at least in the most conventional formulation of a theory, we envision being about 10 to the minus 35 meters in size. That fantastically small number that we encountered just a moment ago. And that is such a small number that it's hard even to wrap your mind around just how small it is. So let me give you an analogy. If we were to take an atom, and magnify it to be as large as the observable universe. That is a huge scale of magnification. Under that same huge scale of magnification, a string would grow to be about as big as an average tree. So a tree is to the entire observable universe as a string is to an atom. So even on atomic scales, these things are so fantastically small that it is beyond our ability to see them even with the most powerful equipment that we have. That's why the theory, at least at the moment, remains untested. As I said, though, at the end, I will suggest a perhaps indirect test that may be coming up in the next few years. But what I'd like to do is imagine that string theory is correct and see what it tells us. Now, the first thing that we hope it tells us, and in fact, it does tell us, and it's the reason why we're really excited about it, it tells us how to put together the laws of the big and the small, the problem that the conventional ideas stumbled upon. And the explanation is, is subtle. Let me give you first in words, then I'll show you a little visual. It goes like this. So remember what the problem was. We took the elevator, we went down to very, very small scales, and the fabric of space was undergoing those wild undulations. Einstein's ideas couldn't cope. What string theory says is that when you go from the old idea of a point particle to a string, what you wind up doing is you spread the particle out. <coughs> Excuse me, you smear it out. You kind of extrude it. Now, when you spread anything out, you dilute it, right? If I take a drop of ink and I let it go in a vat of water, as the ink spreads out, it dilutes. Similarly, particles dilute when you turn them into strings. And what's not obvious, but I'll show you in a visual, the fabric of space also winds up being diluted by this progression from dots to filaments. Now imagine the widely undulating fabric is a piece of rubber. And imagine you dilute it by stretching it out. Well, as you stretch it, you can see the undulations will still be there, but by spreading them out, you minimize them. You decrease them. And in fact, string theory decreases them just enough that there's no longer a problem with melding it with Einstein's ideas. That's the explanation of words. Let me show you a visual. Now, the visual goes by a little bit fast, so let me prepare you for what you will see. The first thing that will come up on the screen is the problem before string theory, the widely undulating space. I'll then draw a white box. Focus your attention in on the white box. I'll then bring in the new idea of strings, and watch what happens. The strings, in essence, will spread out space, and as space spreads, watch what happens to the jitters. Okay, so if you could bring the lights down. 
In fact, you could bring down these spots on the stage too, so this is vibrant. Okay, so here we go. There's the problem. Widely undulating space. There's the white box. Focus your attention inside. I'll now bring in the strings. Watch what happens to the grid lines. They're being pushed apart by the strings. Look at the jitters. As space spreads, they die down. And in fact, they die down just enough for there no longer to be a conflict. I'll bring the lights back up between Einstein's ideas and those of quantum mechanics. This is why people have decided to devote their professional lives to working out this theory. Because finally it puts the big and the small together in one consistent framework. But now let me move on from this and talk about what string theory says beyond this about the fabric of the cosmos. And the most strange thing that string theory tells us, it's, uh, I've known about it for decades, but it's still find it really mind-boggling. The mathematics of the theory tells us that there cannot only be three dimensions of space. We all know about left, right, back, forth, and up, down. The three dimensions of common experience. We all move through these dimensions freely in day-to-day -day life. String theory says that there have to be additional dimensions of space beyond the ones that we can directly see. And just to be clear, I'm not sort of talking about, say, a diagonal dimension. You know, that's a combination of going this way and that way. I'm talking about brand new directions, brand new dimensions that we have never seen. Now, I wish I could explain to you why the theory demands that there be extra dimensions. I have tried for a very long time to come up with some analogy, some non-technical way of communicating this feature of string theory, and I have failed. I cannot find a non-technical way of explaining this fact. There's a mathematical equation, you solve it, and it tells you that there cannot be three dimensions of space. It says there have to be more. In fact, it says there have to be ten dimensions. Let's take that as a mathematical fact and think about what it means. First off, how could that possibly be compatible? with the world that we see around us, which clearly only has three dimensions. And there are a number of ways that people have tried to make sense of this prediction. I'm going to focus in on one, and it goes like this. I, uh, if I had a piece, you know what, I'll, I'll just do, if I had a piece of paper, I would do it in, in real time, but you know what, just imagine I had a piece of paper right in here, an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper that's nice and white, no lines on it, now, flat on the surface of that piece of paper are two dimensions. There's a left-right dimension and an up-down dimension, flat on the surface of the page. Now, imagine in your mind's eye that I take that piece of paper and I roll it up into a tube. Now I've got a tube, a paper tube. It certainly still has two dimensions on its surface because I haven't destroyed a dimension by rolling it up. But I have changed the character of one of the dimensions because up-down has now been turned into a circular dimension, a clockwise, counterclockwise dimension. And imagine further, this would actually be hard for me to do with a real piece of paper, but imagine I wind the tube ever more tightly, making the circular cross-section smaller and smaller. At some point, the tube will be so thin that you won't even see that it has a circular cross-section at all. You'll think it's just a straight line. So much so that if I told you that a little ant was living out its life on this tube, you'd say, you know, poor little fella, he can only go left and right. But then if you say, or, you know, in the back of the auditorium, you, you take your binoculars, you zoom in, by magnifying the tube, you're able to see that there is actually another direction that the ant can walk. It can walk in the clockwise, counterclockwise direction, a direction that you missed when you didn't have a sufficiently powerful magnifying instrument. So the idea is dimensions can be big and easy to see or tiny and curled up and much harder to detect. Maybe that notion applies not just to an object like a tube in our universe, but to the fabric of the cosmos itself. Maybe space has three big dimensions that are easy to see, left, right, back, forth, up, down. But like the tube, which has a curled up dimension, maybe space has curled up dimensions. All around us, just curled up so tightly that we have not seen them. 
That's the idea. Let me show you what that would look like. So if you can bring the lights down again. So I'll start with a, a version of that analogy. That's a traffic light being supported by a cable. And you'll note that from a distant vantage point here, the cable looks one-dimensional. It looks like a straight line because you don't have the visual acuity to see the cross-section. But if you zoom in and take the perspective of a little ant, the ant's so small that it can walk along the cable, but also walk around it. And I, I do hope you appreciate this visual because it took so long to get the ants to do this. But there you have it, big dimensions that are easy to see, curled up ones, much harder to detect. Now let's apply this to space itself. So we think space is three-dimensional. I can only show two on a screen. But if we go deeper and deeper, smaller and smaller into the fabric of space, if these ideas are correct, at some point we would encounter additional dimensions, additional directions. If you had an ultra-microscopic ant walking around down there, It'd be able to walk in the big dimensions, the grid that you and I can traverse, but it would also be able to walk around the tiny curled up dimensions that you and I miss in everyday life. Now, string theory does not say that the extra dimensions of space are little circles. Instead, it says that they are somewhat more complicated geometrical shapes. These fellows right here, they are known as Kalabiao shapes. These are complex killer manifolds of vanishing first churn class, vanishing Richie tensor, but if that language offends you, just look at the picture. <laughs> and as you can see, they have this rich intertwined geometry. And if these ideas are correct, this is what the microscopic fibers of space look like. Big dimensions that you and I can see, but we're surrounded everywhere by these additional curled up dimensions that are just so small that we have not seen them with the naked eye and we've not yet developed equipment powerful enough to reveal their existence. You can bring the lights back up. Now, that is a stunning idea. But I can well imagine again that you might say to yourself, well, okay, you know, if there are these other dimensions, you know, if something is really small, I guess it could be there and, and we haven't seen it. But you could say, you know, you could say that about a lot of stuff. You know, there could be little tiny green people walking around down there. If they're small enough, we wouldn't have seen them either, you know. And, um, and that is true. That is one of the other predictions of string theory. <laughs> now, I have to, um, <laughs> I have to thank you for, for laughing at that because um, I tried out that line not, not too long ago and there was complete silence in the audience. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know what to make of it. But no, that is not one of the other predictions of string theory. But remarkably, and I, I consider this to be one of the most remarkable features of string theory, it's not merely that the theory makes a prediction of more dimensions that we don't see, so we have to find some way of hiding them away or else the theory is wrong. These extra dimensions may hold the answer to one of the deepest, and in fact, to my mind, perhaps the deepest question in all of science. And that question is simply this. Over the last hundred years or so, scientists have measured about 20, 25 numbers that seem to be really intrinsic to the structure of the universe. Numbers like the mass of the electron, the mass of the quarks, the strength of gravity, the strength of the electromagnetic force, the strength of the nuclear force, and on and on, a list of about 20, 25 numbers that we now know with fantastic precision. But nobody knows why they have the particular numerical values that they do. Now, you could say, you know, should I be concerned or should I care if the electron weighed a little bit more or weighed a little bit less? That's just sort of a fact of the universe. Do I, do I really need to care about that? And I would urge you that you should care about it a lot. Because if you changed any of those numbers by even a small amount, you completely change the universe. You destroy much of what we are familiar with in the universe. If I had a machine up here with, say, 20 dials, and I let a random person come up, and start to fiddle with the strength of gravity and the mass of the electron. For almost any fiddling that you do, you destroy all the stars in the universe. Stars rely upon nuclear processes, which demand delicate and intricate interrelationships between those numbers. You start playing with those numbers, you spoil the relationships, 
Stars don't light up. Without stars, the universe is a very different place. So the question is, why do those numbers have just the right values to allow stars to shine and planets to form and on at least one such planet, this one, life to exist and evolve? Now, nobody has answered that question. No theory has. But string theory has at least for the first time given a framework that has the capacity to answer the question. And the framework simply goes like this. In string theory, those numbers, the 20 numbers, reflect how strings can vibrate. Now, strings are so small that they don't just vibrate in the big dimensions that we can see with our eyes. They also vibrate into the tiny curled up dimensions. And just as the air streams going through a French horn have vibrational patterns that are dictated by the geometry of the instrument, the vibrational patterns of these little strings are dictated by the geometry, the twists and turns of the extra dimensions. So if we knew exactly what the extra dimensions looked like, we don't. But if we did, we might be able to calculate the vibrational patterns, calculate the 20 numbers. And if the answers we got agreed with experiment, wow, what a moment that would be. So let me show you a visual of what that would look like. So if you can bring the lights down. So there is a version of the analogy I've just given. You got a French horn air is going through it, the vibrational patterns of the air depend upon the geometry that the air is passing through. If we now segue to the real interest, not a French horn, but one of these geometrical shapes, you can imagine that if a string is vibrating in this environment, the geometry, the twists and turns will affect how it can vibrate, how it gives rise to a particular numerical value for one of those 20 numbers. So I bring a string in here just to show that. You can see as the string is vibrating, the shape of the vibration is affected by the environment. Now, as I mentioned, if we only knew exactly what the extra dimensions look like, we could actually do the mathematics and calculate the vibrational patterns, calculate those numbers. The problem is this. You can bring the lights back up. When I was a graduate student in the 1980s, when these ideas were first discovered, we knew of a handful of possible shapes, a handful of these so-called Calabiao shapes for the extra dimensions. In fact, my dissertation was one of the first mathematical analyses of these shapes trying to extract the physics that it would give rise to were it the form for the extra dimensions. Now, when there were a handful, five or 10 possible shapes, that is a tractable problem. You can have a few graduate students set to work to do the calculations. But since then, the 80s and 90s, the number of shapes grew from 10 to 100, to 1,000, to 10,000, to 100,000. Today, the number, as of six months ago, stood around 10 to the 500. That is a lot of different possibilities for the shape of the extra dimensions, and we don't have a principle to tell us which is the right one. People have amassed catalogs of these shapes. I mean, 10 to the 500 is such a huge number. Do you know how many particles there are in the observable universe? It's about 10 to the 80. Do you know how much bigger 10 to the 500 is than 10 to the 80? so much bigger that if you took 10 to the 500 and you subtracted 10 to the 80, the answer would be 10 to the 500. It wouldn't make a difference. <laughs> There's no way that you're going to amass enough graduate students to analyze all these shapes. <laughs> so what do you do? This is where the controversy happens. Some people say this means that string theory has drifted into a non-scientific subject. Others suggests that we simply don't know enough and that one day we will have the principle that allow us to pick out the shape for the extra dimensions and we'll do the calculations and make predictions and either the numbers will or won't agree with the 20 that we have measured and if they do fantastic if they don't it'll just be a wrong theory others have taken what some consider an extreme approach and it's the final thing that I will mention to you some have suggested that maybe the way we need to think about it is this. Maybe ours is not the only universe. Maybe there are many, many universes out there. Maybe, in fact, infinitely many universes. This is an idea that doesn't 
even come from string theory. There's an independent path that takes you to this idea. Inflationary cosmology, one day have me back and I'll talk about it. But inflationary cosmology suggests that there may be many, many universes out there. And the string theory twist is that maybe the different universes have different shapes for the extra dimensions. One shape in that universe, another shape in that universe, and on and on it goes. In our universe, the shape has its particular form simply because it gives rise to the 20 numbers compatible with our chemistry and our biology. We can't live in the other universes with the other shapes because it would be incompatible with our form of life. So there is no fundamental explanation for why the shape has the form that it does. It takes on all possibilities. We simply live in that corner of this megaverse, this multiverse, where it's compatible with our form of life. So let me show you a little visual what that might look like. So you bring the lights down. Thank you. <clears throat> so we imagine the beginning of the universe where it's very dark and very still, perhaps more still than I had anticipated. <laughs> there we go. So <laughs> the universe comes into existence. And in this inflationary cosmology, as I mentioned, it's called the universe undergoes fantastically fast expansion. And what happens is little pocket universes, as they are called, open up. Now, they look small, but each one of these is meant to be a universe as big as ours or larger. And the idea is that you have all these different universes out there, each with a different shape for the extra dimensions. Now, if we zoom in on one particular universe, let's say it's ours, we go into that bubble, and by penetrating in, we get a view that's familiar, say, from the Hubble Space Telescope. Stars and galaxies scattered throughout space. But if we zoom through this particular pocket universe, our home, and exit out into the grander multiverse, we would see that there are other universes out there. And if we focus in on another one, a different one, with a different shape for the extra dimensions, we go into it. Because the shape is different, physics is different. And instead of having galaxies, you have kind of this green stuff which is just meant to indicate that physics can be different. You may not even have galaxies. You may not have any form of life. If you exit again, this is the picture of the entire multiverse that you come to. So this, even bring the lights back up, is really where the heart of the controversy is. For the story that I'm telling, it's sort of a wondrous culmination of thinking about the fabric of the cosmos, but some people think talk of other universes lacks any scientific rigor, because you can't actually go to those uni other universes. My view is that if you have a theory and you're able to test it in some way that gives you real strong confidence in the theory, if it then predicts that there are other universes, you have to take that prediction seriously. So this is where the controversy stands. But of course, that line of reasoning would require some sort of test of string theory. And that's the final visual that I'll give you, a possible test that will happen in the next few years, I consider it quite a long shot, but who knows, maybe we will get lucky. It's a test that may happen at the Large Hadron Collider, this particle accelerator in Geneva, Switzerland. The idea is this particle accelerator sends protons circling around in opposite directions near the speed of light. They smash into each other, and the calculations suggest that if they smash into each other with enough energy, they may create some debris that gets ejected out of our dimensions sent into the others. How do we know that? Well, if debris gets ejected away, it'll carry energy, which means if you measure energy just before the collision and just after, there should be a little less after than before because some drifted into the other dimensions where we don't have access to it. That's the idea. So the final visual then, if you can bring the lights down, please. The debris has a name. It's called a graviton particle. It doesn't really matter much. The idea is the same. So let me now just show you the particles slamming into each other. Sometimes just glancing blows, not much will happen, but sometimes this graviton particle may get ejected outwards, noticed by its absence. And you bring the lights back up. And if that experiment 
has a positive outcome, establishing that there are other dimensions, establishing that string theory is likely to be true, think about what a spectacular narrative that would mean for space and time. Way back with Newton, absolute space, absolute time, inert backdrop. Einstein comes along and says, no, space, time, they can warp and curve to communicate gravity. Quantum mechanics comes along and says, well, if they're real, if they can do something, they're subject to uncertainty, you get these wild jitters. Everything falls apart. String theory comes in, solves the wild jitters, but yields its own revolution. Extra dimensions of space, the possibility of a multiverse where extra dimensions will have different shapes all throughout the cosmos. To me, if we can establish that our very understanding of how many dimensions of space there are has been misguided for 2,000 years since we have even thought about these questions, to me that'll be one of the major intellectual breakthroughs of our species. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Fernandez, and I'm a physics professor here and chair of the Division of Science and Environmental Policy. And I have the honor and privilege of um, asking Dr. Green some questions, uh, some of which my students have provided for me uh, in class this week. Um, but while we're getting set up, I wanted to make a couple, uh, one, one announcement in particular. I wanted to thank the Cannery Row Company for uh, providing housing for our guest speaker uh, for this event. Just a few questions for you here today. <laughs> Actually, it's, it's, it's a smaller set. So uh, one thing I wanted to say is I assume you don't have any problems with students falling asleep in class. Oh, uh, it happens now and then. <laughs> but I use a laser pointer with uh, adequate fidelity. Great. One of the questions I wanted to ask you um, and some of my students had some interest in this too, is could you say something about black holes and um, how string theory helps to address some of the questions and concerns that come up around the theories that we normally use when talking about black holes? Sure, I, I think as most people by now are largely familiar, black holes are regions of space where generally a tremendous amount of matter, usually a star, has collapsed to a very small size, creating such a powerful gravitational field that anything that gets too close can't get away. Even light can't get away, and that's why it's black. The absence of light is dark, and the black hole is a place in space where nothing can emanate. Now, as far as string theory is concerned, black holes are, in fact, the domain in which string theory has made its greatest impact. It's not something that I had time to speak about before, but just briefly, Stephen Hawking in 1974 realized something strange, which is when quantum mechanics is included, black holes are actually not perfectly black. Black holes actually can radiate a certain amount of energy quantum mechanically. And when you take that into account, you realize that black holes also have what is known as entropy or disorder. And without getting technical, Hawking was able to determine using certain calculations that were skirting on the edge <coughs> of knowledge how much entropy a black hole should have. But nobody was able to really make those calculations precise, to actually count the disorder in a way that's familiar in other systems that have disorder. String theory came along, and two string theorists in particular, Andy Strominger and Kumran Vafa, were able to use the mathematics of string theory to calculate the disorder of black holes. And the answer they got agreed bang on with what Hawking had found using these softer methods in the 1970s. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Another question some of the students in my class had is, these strings are about 10 to the minus 35th meters, you said. But do they vary in size? Can you get a string that's 1.1 times 10 to the minus 35th, another one that's 1. 1.8 <coughs> times 10 to the minus 35th? Yes, you can. Um, so strings carry energy in a number of different ways. 
In fact, as I'm answering this question, I'm just going to go get some more water. But I think the mic will work, so I'll just talk as That's I walk fine. if you don't, if you don't <laughs> no mind. No problem. So, so strings can carry energy in a number of different ways. So I described how they can carry energy in vibrations, but they also can carry energy in their length. The longer they are, the more energy they have. So in principle, if you put enough energy into a string, you can not only make it 1.1 times 10 to the minus 35, you could make it as big as you want in principle. If you had tweezers and could grab hold of both sides of a string and pull on it, if you pulled with sufficient power, injecting enough energy, that string could grow macroscopically large. I say that because it's a physical fact if string theory is correct. In practice, it would be very hard to do that. These strings are very tense. They have a tension of about 10 to the 20 tons. So you'd have to pull pretty hard to stretch them out big. But in principle, that's something that could happen. And in fact, just as a footnote, it's possible that the universe in its cosmic evolution may have stretched out strings. And some have done calculations that maybe there are strings wafting through space, long ones. <coughs> And as they vibrate, they may give off radiation that we can see. And there are some experiments that are going to look for that gravitational radiation. That may be another way of testing some of these ideas. Okay. The late great physicist, uh, Dr. Richard Feynman, was once quoted as saying, and I'll paraphrase, um, that if a topic cannot be reduced to being taught at the freshman college level, then we really don't understand it. Um, I think he may have been referring to quantum mechanics. In any case, do you agree with his statement? And if not, is there anything that you felt you had to leave out of your writings as a result? Uh, it's a good question. I know that, that phrase from another physicist. Uh, perhaps every generation has their person that they lay that phrase on. Uh, <laughs> a, a far less, you know, you know, Feynman certainly didn't care much about being PC. But um, <laughs> it was Rutherford, I believe, who had a version of that where he said, um, not to a freshman, he said, if you can't explain a part of science to, excuse me, to a barmaid, um, then you don't really understand it. I mean, that, that was his version of this. I'm glad it has morphed uh, into, a, <laughs> into a more appropriate version in, in the modern age. Do I, do I agree that almost? There, there are some things whose details are well understood, but so far removed from experience that bridging the gap in a sensible way is nearly impossible. An example was, I, I said, this notion of 10 dimensions in, in string theory. I mean, I feel like I understand it well. I can do the calculations, and I see where it pops out of the mathematics. And I've spent my life believing what math tells me to the extent where I don't even process that it's a different way of knowing something. Nevertheless, it's very hard to communicate that at a general level. However, I do think that the overarching ideas in just about any subject can be communicated in a way that anybody with interest can understand. And it is the case that as a field matures and we understand it better, it is often the case that we also get better at explaining it in ways that don't require the technical details. Thank you. Um, are there any, this is going to get a little, maybe a little less physics related on this question. Are there any lessons? ethical, spiritual, moral, and so on, that you've gained, of course, in addition to the intellectual ones. And you can share with us regarding any of your theoretical work on the structure of the universe and the role that mankind plays both in the universe and on our planet. Uh, if there are any of those lessons that have come out of... Come out of your own work, or even of, out of physics, like maybe even how you live or how we could all live in a better way. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> That's uh, fair. <laughs> Uh, but, but let me just amplify that slightly. Um, I, mean, I mean, I think it's certainly the case that what you learn from this kind of science, and I think science more generally, is that there is a certain fundamental harmony with how the universe is put together. There's a certain kind of, of beauty, and there's a certain kind, of, that's why I chose the title, there's a certain kind of elegance in how the universe is put together. And I think that speaks to something that many of us feel intuitively that there is an explanation, there is an understanding for why we're here and why the universe is here. And many people then take that intuitive feeling and go in various directions. Some people take it into poetry, some to music, some to art, some into religion. Some of us take it into trying to understand the fundamental structure 
of the universe better. But in a way, all of it is walking around the same kind of truth, the deep coherence of the universe. Can you comment? Uh, you mentioned right near the end about experimental verification of, of string theory. You mentioned CERN. And I know about a year and a half ago, they did their test. They said, we're about to do a test. And they pressed a button. They said, oh, the test worked you know, half a second later because the, the small particle went around. Um, where is that now? And, and at what, how, how, how long will it be until we can actually make tests that might be able to shed some more light on string theory? Uh, well, well, it's a great question. <clears throat> and some of you may recall, it was, I think it was roughly a year ago now, right? It was, it was last September. And the reason why the pushing the button got so much attention was kind of interesting. I don't think it was planned. But word got out that this machine could destroy the world by the creation of microscopic black holes. I don't know if you remember that this wire was out there. You know, the thought was, and, and it's real science. It comes out of string theory. You know, when you slam these particles together, you cram enough energy into a small enough space, you can create a little tiny black hole. But a little tiny black hole, maybe it sucks in its surrounding and sort of Geneva falls in. And <clears throat> that's not really so terrible, but you know, you keep on going and you start to worry about your own backyard. And because of that concern, when they turned on the machine, I've never been asked to be on so many <laughs> radio and television programs on something to do with science. Um, <clears throat> indeed, it's not something to worry about. And if someone is concerned, I, I, I can tell you why. But you're right, they turned on the machine, and they had a particle go around in one direction. They never got to the stage of collisions because the machine broke, uh, as some may know. It, the machine relies upon supercooled, superconducting magnets, 9,000 of them, in fact. And if these magnets get hot, they lose that superconducting quality. And indeed, that's what happened. And the machine broke down because of that. And I'm told that they have resolved the issue and that perhaps by November, December, it will turn back on. One thing I should say is some people have like breathed a sigh of relief that the machine was turned on and the Earth wasn't destroyed. But no collisions have happened yet. Now, I'm not saying that because you worry, uh, but your worry should not be found, that the lack of a worry should not be founded on the machine having done the collisions yet. It should be founded on our understanding that there is no Brian, uh, your books have helped bring, um, well, first of all, 10 years ago, uh, maybe 12 years ago, you were a faculty member, a top researcher in string theory, but you hadn't yet written a book that, that you, had, of the, of the, you hadn't yet written a book. Since then, you've written two that have brought you international attention. Um, and with, with this uh, esoteric subject that you've been writing about in the mainstream, how has your celebrity status affected you're standing in academic and personal circles. <laughs> well, uh, it's hard to say, but maybe some data points are relevant. Um, 1997, um, that'd be 12 years ago, yeah. 1997, um, I was not married. Now I am. Does that have to do with the books? I don't know. Um, you know, I'd like to think it wasn't, but you know, you never know. Um, uh, in, in terms of um, more seriously, um, I definitely am, am spending part of my time in a way that I didn't really anticipate. I was perfectly happy working 12, 15 hours a day on research. I recall, you know, when I was a junior faculty member at Cornell, everybody would go home at 5 or 6 in the evening. I'd stay till 2 in the morning, and I'd be back there at 9. And that was a perfectly fine life. Now I find that I don't have the time to put in 15-hour days, and it's painful in some way, but I think there are various things which are important. One is the research, and the other is allowing the general public to be excited about ideas and excited about science, and if there isn't that kind of translation happening, I think there's a real barrier to having that happen. So to me, it's a constant struggle to balance the two, and I don't know that I always find the best balance, but uh, to me, it's important to do both. This may have to be the last question. I'm not sure. But uh, <laughs> yeah, OK. Um, Brian, can you comment on what you think it will take to improve science education, besides funding? Of course, we know that. <coughs> at all grade levels, and that includes uh, the university level as well. 
Um, I'm happy to. It, it actually is something that we were discussing a little bit over dinner. You know, I, I feel strongly that what we need to do in science education is not focus so quickly, so intensely on the details of science. However useful the details may be to testing comprehension, however useful the details can be for those few students who go on in science. But I think what we need to do in science education is paint the big, wondrous picture better. We need to inspire kids to want to learn the details by virtue of showing them how the details matter for questions like how did the universe begin and how did life begin and how did consciousness begin? How might the universe end? Is the universe infinitely big? Did time have a beginning? I mean, these are great questions that anybody can get excited about. And I feel strongly if we'd only get people excited about these questions at a young age, there'd be far more interest in sticking with science as opposed to dropping. I mean, we all start as scientists, right? Little kids, smash things together, pull them apart, want to understand their environment. And somehow, by the time they're 9, 10, 11, 12, they begin to drift from that. And I think the drift is because we don't keep them with the wonder. on behalf of all of our faculty and staff and students and guests who are here tonight we have a very small token of our appreciation so you'll remember Monterey Bay and the scientific otters who are here on our campus thank you very much I'll get it And with that, we conclude the formal presentation. I remind you that he will be in the lobby signing books and so forth. You can get in line. We need to give him about five minutes so that he can uh, get his energy back and get refocused. And he'll meet you out in the lobby. There is some coffee and stuff out in front. The rest of the coffee is on the house. So enjoy and see you at the next presentation. Thank you all. Sure, sure.